Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Collections Technology Think Tank. My name's Colin White. I'm from Credit Cadet Media. Um, thank you for everybody who's joined us. Um, and for those of you who just did, uh, joined us on the last session, hope you enjoyed it. Um, this next session, we're going to look at collections risk, but just a quick bit of housekeeping for I um, continue with this session and introduce our speakers and our chair. So uh, in this session, uh, or on this event platform, I should say, you've got information on the event. Have a look at that. Um, following this session, we've got a, 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 in the next um, segment, we'll look at, um, it, it, we've, got, we've got a session on uh, future of collections, but also on one on propensity to pay. So if you want to log and register for that, there's a link within the platform here, please do that got information on all of our speakers there's a couple of things you can download some interesting stuff on there um so have a look at those links as well um and more importantly um if you can and you want to contribute on our social media please do that on linkedin and twitter using the um hashtag collections tech tt um alongside that we would welcome your input as well throughout this event so if you've got any comments or questions there's a speech bubble icon there please feel free to um, ask those questions. We had lots in the last session, really great. We didn't get through them all. Um, and what we will do is we will share a review uh, this time next week, or next Thursday on the Credit Connect website with that, um, some feedback, some written answers from our speakers, um, and also some event polls, which we're going to run in this session as well. So any input anybody can give watching inwards would be awesome. So... In this session, um, we're going to look at collections risk, as I mentioned. Um, our chair for this session is Chris Warburton um, from RO Strategy. Um, he's going to introduce our panel, and then we'll get started on looking at this discussion. So, Chris, if we could hand over to you, that would be great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Colin. So, um, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, so, so, so welcome. Just add my welcome to the uh, Collections Technology Think Tank. Um, a little bit, uh, and this session here, which is really around sort of assessing collections risks. Um, a little bit on my background, just for those of you who didn't join the last session. So yeah, my name is Chris Warburton, uh, so I'm going to chair the event. Uh, a little bit of my background, so I spent the last 20 years or so uh, really in risk operations, uh, looking after and sort of running, you know, processes across the customer lifecycle, everywhere from sort of credit through to collections. Um, and I'm currently the director of uh, RO Strategy. Uh, and we've been, we've been really the last couple of years have sort of been exploring some of the latest ideas, innovation and technology in credit collections. And there's been a lot going on. Uh, and we'll talk about some of those things today. So and I'm delighted to be chairing, chairing this event. Um, and um, with me today, with me today, we've got um, uh, th th three, three, great, three great speakers. We've got uh, Andrew Older, who's the commercial director at Paylink. Uh, we've got uh, Craig, uh, Craig uh, Hinchliffe, uh, who's the uh, at Perch Group. Um, and we've got uh, Shiraz Afsal, um, who's the um, uh, Risk and Compliance Director at Quint. Um, so uh, maybe I'll just ask uh, each of you guys, and you're very welcome to thank you for joining us, but just maybe just introduce yourself just with a one line of sort of about what you do in, in each of your organisations. Um, Andrew, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so um, Andrew Alder, uh, Director at Paling Solutions. So past 15 years, spent time in, in, in focus on collections, lending, and then debt advice more re re recently. So P Paylink, we're, we're an FCA-regulated fintech um, software company who specialise in digital INEs and self-serve arrangements through our Embark product. Um, we've got about 25 organisations using our software across FS, debt advice and utilities, and, and, and most recently buy now, pay later. And since we launched in 2017, we've seen around about just over a million a million affordability assessments go through our go through our solution. Okay, fantastic. Um, Craig, do you want to just a quick introduction around uh, Perch Group and what you guys do? Yeah, you said there was three great speakers, so I've counted Andrew Shiraz. Are you the third? I'm not the third. I was you guys, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Craig Kingsley at the Perch Group. Uh, accountant by trade, but um, spent eight years at Arrow Global, and I've been four and a half years now at the Perch Group. So we're a uh, a pretty new uh, debt purchaser, uh, kind of in the U UK focus, uh, grew up in the high cost space, uh, but we're diversing now uh, as we look into kind of other, other asset classes. Um, within the group, we've got a debt purchase business, we've got a DCA, and we've got a legal services firm as well as a field collection business. So hopefully, um, hopefully pretty relevant experience to support the discussions today. Okay, fantastic. And uh, Shiraz? Yes, yeah, so I'm Shiraz, uh, Legal Risk and Compliance Director at, at Quint. Quint, we have a, a 
a group of businesses that power all aspects of credit from business to business, loan comparison, business to consumer comparison sites, uh, some credit intelligence uh, to consumers, data business, uh, a payments business, and um, a lending business. So we're we're we're, we're Got a pretty good panorama across across the space, and, uh, and prior to that, I probably spent twenty years meddling in uh, legal and compliance in, in consumer finance, from sort of big banks to uh, subprime to then high cost short term credit. So I've been around the space for a while. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, so you said right at the top. I mean, this this um, this session is really around sort of assessing collections risks. Um, and we've already talked a little bit, even in the previous session, around some of the challenges the economy is facing, uh, consumers are facing these days, um, and particularly with the, the pandemic, but even so more more recently with some of the cost of living kind of issues around what was in what was what what went before is not necessarily indicative of the current or the future situation, and it does feel like we're in this sort of like system of sort of massive change. Um, so, so this session here, we're going to talk a little about how should we react to this? You know, does this change the way we need to assess collections, collections risk? Is the new data that, that, that might be out there or new analytical techniques or just basically new approaches we've got to think about? Um, so that was, that was the topic of discussion for, for this session here. Uh, and Craig, I was going to come to you first. That's OK. I mean, I mean, you know, I just described the world. I mean, are we really in a new world um, or is it actually just more of the same? And there's always been change that's kind of going on. I mean, we're definitely in a new world, aren't we, post, post-pandemic? Um, but that's just a global, you know, macro piece that we've got yeah. rising inflation, we've got labour shortages. Um, everything that you thought you understood, you no longer understand stagflation, et cetera. Um, but the question is, how does that flow through to the collections world? So, you know, during COVID, most people I speak to had increased collections during the back end of COVID with people working from home, increased affordability. And that seems to have turned on its head. Um, so I think trying to predict what's going to happen in the next six to 12 months is always hard. We, we know and talk a lot about inflation, the cost of living crisis. So we know there's a headwind coming. Um, looking in our numbers, we um, just looking at the basic numbers. So arrangement rates, arrangement amounts, settlement volume, settlement amounts. We're not seeing any issues with current arrangements breaking. So mm. there's, no, there's no problem with existing customers' affordability. Uh, we're seeing a slight dip in settlement volume. So we're, what, was, what we believe is happening is people are holding on to money uh, to prepare for, for unknown headwinds. Um, and the break-in rates for non-paying accounts is slightly bit below below expectation. So we're definitely starting to see a slight downward shift, but nothing mm. too dramatic. Um, but I think I think to answer your question, we're in an unknown world where things seem to turn on a penny, like, uh, you know, and it's very hard to predict what six months is going to look like, what twelve months is going to look like, and and where we'll be in three years, um, given yeah. given the rate of change that we've experienced today. I- Shiraz, what's what's your kind of view on it in terms of like you know do we have to think about things differently and and how how should we think about things differently? Well, I, I, I think there's two aspects to that. One is the sort of the macroeconomic effect that Craig touched on. So I mean, what Craig was saying there reminded me um, of you know I guess I've been through three of these macro events now. You know, mm-hmm. I remember the, uh, the the liquidity crisis in 07, 08, and and, and in every situation. One spent time with lots of clever quants, doing lots of models and, and, and looking at what the impact was going to be uh, on the book. And, and in every single situation, the quants were incorrect. Um, and actually, on a, on a collections piece, on a non-prime book, collections have always made, remain resilient. Um, so I think it is relatively futile and pointless if you're in a non-prime book to, to, to be speculating too much. I think but where everything is changing... And one thing that I think we're, we're we're slowly sort of grappling with is is understanding human behaviour. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think up until around 2014, 15, um, you know, us as an industry, we just carried on assuming that you know humans behaved rationally. Um, you know, and, and actually, the whole of collections is based around people behaving rationally. You know, income and expenditure, giving you a surplus. You know, people prioritising their priority bills. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what, what behavioural science tells us is that humans don't behave according to this rational Rubicon to which we all subscribe, yeah? So during the during the pandemic holidays, um, during, you know, during the payment holidays we saw in the pandemic, I was doing the run-up of a big, high-cost, short-term lender. My collections went up. And, you know, we're all sort of scratching our head going on, what's going on? And, and anecdotally, we had customers taking payment holidays from their mortgages and using their surplus income to pay off their high-cost, short-term credit debt. So that's absurd. 
from a rational perspective, it's not what the regulator wanted when they were kind of giving people um, payment holidays on their priority debts, and yet that's mm. the consumer behaviour that we saw. So I think I think we're at the stage now where I think you know if you're if you're clever and insightful, you're just beginning to understand the extent of your own ignorance really around mm. you know, what's driving consumer behaviours in in this space. And, and Andrew, I was going to come to you and link back to, to that piece there in terms of like affordability and some of the stuff that, that Craig just mentioned around, you know, maybe starting to see some of it, but also seeing some like some different behavior maybe during during the pandemic. I mean, what what I mean, from, from, from your vantage point, what are some of the th things you've seen around affordability and some of the things you've seen like going through some of your processes or your customers processes? So I think two, two views on this in terms of, you know, existing clients of ours we've, we've seen over the last three to four months mm. a real increase in the number of customers that are complete affordability assessments and um, but when we speak to our clients around you know we're seeing this activity we're seeing this behavior what's driving it are you seeing more people fall into arrears is your, is your late arrears increasing and early arrears increasing and i haven't really seen any trends yet it hasn't started to happen in terms of mortgage arrears are still very very low um, and because of that, I think what we're seeing now is a lot of customers that are up to date being contacted by their lenders to give them some pre arrear support as a pre preemptive way to, to stop mm. them falling into arrears. So I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing more affordability assessments being completed. But I think what we're seeing within the industry at the minute is I think everybody's in that state of, you know, knowing that in the next six months things could significantly change for the worse and people are starting to get their ducks in a row and get themselves sorted in terms of recruitment in terms of looking at technology investing technology so when it comes to looking at the affordability process they have now they all look and say right we need to improve this if we have something that is digital how do we make it better if we don't have something that's digital we need to start looking at that so there's within the industry at the minute there's a lot of rfps and again there's a lot of organizations that are looking to see, well, can we utilize open banking more or can we start use, utilizing open banking within this space? Um, and it's still very much Marmite. You, you see some requests and RFPs come out where it's very much focused on open banking. And then you see RFPs where there's no need for open banking. We just want to understand the customer's affordability. We're, we're not quite comfortable with how open banking potentially works, the adoption rates. And um, so I think... You know, it's quite mixed views on, on where open banking plays with affordability. But um, but yeah, you know, in terms of, you know, clients and creditors, they're, they're interested in, you know, it's doing a, a disservice affordability. They're looking to try and digitalize the full process after someone's completed affordability as well. So there's different risk appetites out there. People are on, on, on different points of view and where they want to digitalize and when they want to have human intervention in that process. Mm. I mean, when we talk a bit about we're talking a bit about volume, I suppose affordability. People calling in and you know going through the affordability assessments. I mean, I, over the last two years, I kind of feel like as an industry we've been a little bit like. Sometimes I feel like almost like we've been like chicken little, right? So we're waiting for the sky to fall in, uh, with you know tsunamis of debt coming through. And I, I was one of those people sort of talking about that in terms of expecting it to come through. I mean, and a lot of the stuff didn't really transpire. Uh, and even today, I mean, some of the stuff we just said now is like we're expecting it to come through. It hasn't transpired necessarily yet from the comments that, that we're seeing now, but we, maybe we're seeing some early indicators. So I don't want to be sort of, you know, are, are we doing the same thing again and there's going to be different behavior that's going to go on? Or is this really, really, we've got risk that's building up in the book that we really, really kind of see now? I mean, I mean, have things fundamentally changed, do you, do you think, from where it was even from back two years ago at the start of the pandemic? I, I think the will do. I think at the minute you, you've got to realize that, you know, consumers, customers are very resilient. Hmm. Um, and you know everyone's acutely aware of the, the, the cost of living. Everybody's impacted by the cost of living, um, but we haven't really seen that make a, 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 a significant impact to people's disposable incomes yet. Um, but if the way, if, if it's more prolonged, the way it continues, it's inevitable that's hmm. going to happen. I mean, I'm, I was going to go to Craig. I mean, do, do you think is there a danger there that we could be shocked by things turning on a dime and all of a sudden, like? It's not just a trickle that's coming through, but there, there really is a flood, and we sort of we get shocked that people then run out of savings, which they were keeping them going on, and now they now they sort of that we get hit by something if we're not ready, or or is it going to be a slow burn? Do you think? I don't know. I, I think it depends on which which market you operate in. 
Um, so, you know, I think Andrew referenced the mortgage market. So, mm. so if you're a prime customer um, on a first charge mortgage, they're going to be okay. You know, they're going to be absolutely fine. You know, in, in the main, typically, you know, you might get a slight uptick in arrears, but it's not going to be a, a cliff edge. Um, the customer's right at the bottom of the market. So you kind of, I appreciate probably not there, but your, your Morse's club type customers, your doorstep customers, again, they've always been right on the brink and they will remain on the brink. So there'll be no real movement there. I think I think where where you might see some changes in the middle, so so you're near nearer primes, uh, the customers that may have over indebted themselves, um, it's those customers that I think where where you've got the real risk. Do I think it's going to turn on an edge? No. Um, just anecdotally, what's happening in our own business and other people I'm speaking to is the big thing that people are noticing is energy rises and, and, and fuel prices. So I'm starting to see we're trying to encourage people back into the office and trying to get back to five days in the office. And the, and the messages I'm hearing are, no, petrol's too too much. I'm going to work three days at home, too, in the office. So people are already offsetting that increased cost through through a change of behavior that's been brought about by the pandemic. The question is, how how resilient can, can the wider economy be at, at, at making savings through change of behavior that, that, that the pandemic's brought about by, you know, working from home, being smarter, et cetera. So I think I don't see a cliff edge. Um, I think it's the middle market that we need to watch. Um, and I think there'll be further changes in, 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 in the workforce's behaviour to, to accommodate some of those, those cost pressures, as well as rising, um, you know, we've got rising wages across the piece. When are they going to catch up? Are they going to are they going to catch up with inflation or not? I think that's the big the big unknown at the moment. Where, is, where are wages going to go? What's going to happen to fuel costs? And if yeah. the fuel costs come down and wages go up, you know, we might get through this. And what government support we're going to get? You know, if Boris is gone. What what's going to happen next? Unknown. And just on the on the on the trap on the travel piece, it'll be interesting to see whether people go back into the office more in the winter when they've got to heat your home, right? And, and those and those kind of things. Those, those kind of like things that are sort of going on in the background. Uh, I, I mean, Shiraz, I mean, do you think do you think there are other do you think there are other data sources we got to start thinking about? And um, you know, Craig, you just talked there quite a bit around you know. Uh, listening to really what's going on on the floor, what's happening with, on the on the customer calls, and that's being a or customer interactions, that's being a source of information. I mean, are there other pieces of information or data that we need to go out to really understand? Almost like the you know patent risks that there are sort of building in the infrastructure or in the, in the portfolio. Sorry, because you're just cutting out slightly much of it's your connection on mine. But I think I think your question was around whether there are sort of any sort of alternate data points that we should be we should be considering when when looking at your know, managing portfolios. Yeah. Um, hey, look, I mean, it's a really good question. I mean, we all know the regulator is doing a, a market study into um, credit information um, right now. I, I, I spoke with them with them last week on it actually um, through some of the businesses that we that we operate. Um, uh, an observation that I made uh, then, and I'll make it again now, is um, I think I think the CRAs have done a fantastic job in selling lots of different extrapolations of what is pretty static data set. You know, you know, what, what, you know it's it's a payment ledger. You know, and, and actually they go, you know, it's, it's it's a binary kind of set of returns: payment yes, payment no, and yet they sort of seem to extrapolate some really weird and wacky stuff from really not a lot of data yeah and and and, and you know mm -hmm. at, at some stage i wonder if the market will go that em you know the emperor's not wearing any clothes here you know that actually how how predictive is data sets that we use i think it's fine in the prime segment and i come back to what craig said around these different markets and i think i think you know, and it's something the FCA have said a number of times that you know there's no such thing as a one consumer credit market. There are a series of mini segments of the market that all operate differently. You know, on different cycles. Subprime is counter cyclical. Prime is very cyclical. Whether you're whether you're on a prime mortgage or your credit card or buy now pay later, you're in a completely different cycle. Um, and yet, it's the one same static data set that serves all those markets at different points. Um, and I think you know. People that trash open banking tend to be those that are come from a CRA background, yeah. So they're sort of incentivized to to be dismissive of the data in in, in the market, you know. And, and and look, open banking is really new, right? So people say, well, the data is 
embryonic. Well, of course it is. Yeah, it's new. You know, I mean, one, 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 you know, don't don't slag off an elephant for being big and great. So you know, don't slag off open banking for being embryonic. Um, and yeah, so look for me, there's a bunch of data uh, that's new and available that isn't being utilised. And again, you know, just to sort of reference the point I made earlier, we need to put that data onto a sort of a different. You know, not onto a rational Rubicon. You know, I think we think about what's the data telling us about how consumers behave. Consumers behave in different ways to we've, we've grown up to be to, to expect. And mm-hmm. actually start looking at that data in a different way, then then I think it's it's potentially really powerful. But look, I think on a 10 year journey to open banking maturity for the data, we're probably at year two. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot more that we can kind of build, and 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 you know things like open banking. I mean, Andrew, I think you mentioned that earlier. I mean, how much of a role has that got to play? Uh, got got to play in terms of uh, assessing affordability? There's a lot been talked about that. Um, I mean, does it give us that extra insight? I think yeah, it, it definitely does from an origination's point of view, uh, without a doubt. And the the value exchange of a customer using that is is far greater than it is in collections currently at the minute. And I think that's the that's the issue that collections is, is, is trying to overcome is what's going to encourage a customer to use open banking to provide their affordability. When you think about people's lives are very much changing on a regular basis. You know, you, you know, one of the, you know, one of the most common reasons for someone struggling financially is they've just lost their job. So is open banking really going to um, give a true reflection of their affordability and that type of, you know, common scenario in, in, in collections. But for, for people who are struggling through the cost of living and they haven't sort of had, a, I'd say, a major life event, then yes, I think open banking is very powerful to use for both parties. And um, But it's, you know, again, it's only as good as the, the number of customers that use it. So, you know, if you only got 20% of your, if your customers complete affordability assessments accessing open banking, then you're going to get some great insight on the 20%. But what about the other 80%? So, so do you think it's possible to do almost like a assess affordability uh, digitally um, or do you think do, is it always going to have to be some sort of human involved? I mean, again, we just we, t- we talked about the value, I suppose, of getting that human interaction. Uh, I think from, from feedback we've had from some of our clients who are literally allowing customers to go through a, a, an affordability journey and use open banking mm. then not have a conversation with them afterwards and, and, make, and make an arrangement digitally <clears throat> when they've looked at you know, where those customers one month, two month, three months later, they're performing as well as customers where they've had a lot of human interaction with, if not if not slightly better in terms of, you know, kept, kept rates is the, mm. it's the holy grail, isn't it, when it comes to arrangements, how good are your kept rates? So there hasn't been anything that's pointing towards open bank and having more of a, a, a poor performing arrangement kept rate performance. Mm. And what, what's your kind of view, uh, Craig, from, from, from your team? Uh, <laughs> In terms of like, in terms of like, I mean, do you have to do you have to have the human involved? We talked about it about about the last time, or do you? I mean, do you get the extra data from having the human involved, or is it is it better to just just rely on the maths? I'm going to say something completely different, actually, which is I have a fundamental issue with the I and E and affordability mm. um, to the extent that it's rear view looking and very hard to get a forward looking view. So. Um, and by that, what I mean is, and I've spoken to some lenders who um, who develop kind of um, uh, affordability algorithms, and, and they're having to take you know the last three months of data, assess affordability over the last three months, and then try and project where they think energy costs are going. So overlay the, those affordability calculators with ONS data, and also with expected inflation, etc. The tricky bit for me is always if you've got a married couple or people cohabiting. When you look at open banking or you do an IE, you're typically looking at that individual. So you're looking at Craig Hinchliffe's income and expenditure, not necessarily the household income and expenditure. And therefore, you don't really get the full picture. And I think the hard part, and a lot, you know, is understanding what is the household's expenditure and what is what are we trying to underwrite? What is the real risk we're trying to underwrite? And how do we underwrite that risk going forward? not retrospectively of, of what they've done in the last three months, because that's not necessarily true. If it's in winter, you've got higher bills. Um, you know, and they, they tail off. And summer people have, you know, far higher spending on holidays. And then as you approach the Christmas months, you know, you've got the expense of Christmas. So if you looked at the first three months of this year, I don't know what you're like in January. I normally have a fairly quiet January. 
fairly quiet February and March. I'm recovering from the year, getting ready for summer. So my expenditure in those three months is very different to my expenditure for the rest of the year. So what I'm saying is, and, and the trick for me is, how do we get some, some IE tools, some affordability tools that are forward looking, that are really dynamic and adjust to the customer? And even then, should we, and I know quite a lot of people are proactive at kind of trying to identify those high, those high risk customers and trying to make interventions before they go bad. You know, is that what the customer wants? Um, because you can't see the household income. Hmm. Do you think, but do you think we're involving it? Especially talk about the household income, but it's also about unique situations and almost like getting it down to like individuals or be it households uh, down, down to that level, that level rather than sort of broader brush or just segments. I mean, do you think we're going to be able to get down to that almost like individual type of scoring? And by individual, I mean household as much as actual individual. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think the data is really powerful. So should a, should a computer do the affordability assessment or should a human? My view is actually it's probably safer to do it using a computer because mm. uh, you can build in far more powerful algorithms that, that can assess certain things. Where the computer fails is to speak to somebody to realize they've got a language barrier or you know, to meet somebody and realize they've got a physical disability that isn't on the form. I think the human interaction, the face-to-face, -face identifies other things that isn't in the data because not everything's in the data. Um, but actually, from a risk perspective, from, from, a, from a lending perspective, the data is more powerful than an individual because you get the same answer and you can yeah. statistically model it. Yeah. And Sharaz, do you kind of agree with that statement or you got a, a different kind of take? Or Yeah, look, I think I, I, I agree with Craig on a couple of big points. One is income expenditure is flawed fundamentally. And, and, and I think I think that you know, we, we, we need to be more dynamic. So that when you're asking someone to do an I&E, especially in affordability, you're effectively asking them to prove they don't need a loan. Yeah, you're saying, show me a surplus. And if you had a surplus, then you'd have a nice ticking balance in your in your eyes that going up. So you don't need a loan, mm. right? So so it's 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 nonsense in my view. The, 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 what you're actually testing, and, and and again, just reflect on 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 Craig there. So you know, Craig manages his expenditure. Yeah. So you know, he has a heavy Christmas. He's clearly told us that, and then you know, he 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 lets his personal balance sheet recover in Q1 before then kind of coming forth with some extravagant spending in Q2 and Q3, yeah? So so, so Craig is managing his expenditure uh, 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 accordingly. And, and I, I, I think that's what we should be testing when we're doing affordability, both at origination and at collections. We should be talking to a customer's ability to manage their expenditure, yeah? So, for example... You know, so one of one of one of my big issues I have with uh, with open banking is how we categorize supermarket spending. Yeah, because mm. how much supermarket spending is on uh, non discretionary stuff and how much discretionary. Yeah, don't know about you guys. If I'm feeling flush, I'll spend a bit more on a bottle of wine, and if I'm feeling a bit tight, I'll spend less on my wine. But that still comes down to a supermarket spend, the same degrees or test score, or card or whatever. Yeah. So so what I'm demonstrating there is my evidence to throttle my expenditure based upon circumstances, and that's what we should be testing for. So, and, and our whole I E is, is not doing that. Yeah, it's, it's static, it's backward looking, and it's not testing the ability of someone to throttle. Um, and that's what, we, that, that's what we need to be moving to. And I suppose there's a bit of a concept there around if they're throttling back, then at some point they can't throttle anymore. And that's where you get the cliff edge rather than, rather than it being sort of like a, a, a general downward, downward spiral, I'd imagine. To an extent. So look, I mean, I, I, I saw a lot of data in my subprime lending days that's told me that free income does not correlate to payment performance. Yeah, so income does. So there's no secret there, yeah? The, 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 more, you know, the more affluent or rich somebody is, the better they are paying back debt. Hmm. What was counterintuitive was the, 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 the amount of free income inversely correlated to payment performance. Um, so, you know, and, and you began to go, well, well, why is that? that? That is counterintuitive. And you then got to the point where you go, well, actually, if somebody is up to it, then actually they're demonstrating good budgeting. Yeah, because yeah. actually they're managing their expenditure lines and they're cutting their cloth according to their capacity. So for sure, to your point around, there comes a point where it can't be throttled back or forth, which assumes there are some kind of there's a basement and a ceiling. I think we all accept that within someone's income, there is a basement and a ceiling to what the expenditure could be. But then I think we need to be thinking about, well, actually, just because someone is close to it, you know, does it mean they're, they're necessarily in trouble? You know, and I think, yeah. but then how do we get to that information? You know, um, 
and I've got some views on that, you know, and I'm sure everyone does as well. But I think that's we're looking at the richness of of the data points that we have to and, and asking ourselves different questions when we're looking at the data is is the key. Yeah, I mean, I mean I'll come back to to Andrew um, in terms of like some of the stuff that you guys that you guys do. I mean, sort of, you know, we do use we do use the the INE. I mean, it's it's one of the it's the one of the tools we have for for, for better for worse. And there's a, you know, almost like a, a regulator and industry standard around that. I mean, but where else can we can we take it further i mean i know you guys you talked a bit about open banking but you know where, where is where is the extra richness of data and where do you think where can where can we take it and can we get down to that almost like segmentation of one almost yeah i, th I think just just go back a couple of points referenced there by by craig, craig especially is you're right for, for, for a perfect customer to use open bank and the stars have all got where you're aligned you've got a you know, if, you, if it's a joint, you're joint households, you've got to have joint bank accounts. In that scenario, it works really well. And I think what's what's quite ironic is, I think I read the other week around the Bank of England have relaxed some of the stress testing on um, lending to make sure that people can afford the mortgage when the, the Bank of England base rate moves up. And what we'll discuss there, we almost need that type of stress testing for affordability assessments and collections to make sure that you know, seasonally when people spend more that they can can afford to, their repayments around Christmas time when energy goes up as well. So that there has to be, I think, an element of potentially looking at stress testing when affordability assessments are being done to have that a best forward looking view as you can. But I think when it comes when it comes to open banking, the potential is there to have that forward looking view. And one of the easiest for, forward looking views is just to have reoccurring open banking pools on a more regular basis to keep up to date with what the customer is spending. So the customer does that, but the, the, the challenge with that and the challenge with all this with, with, with technology is, is engagement is, you know, making it worthwhile enough for the customer to continue to do that reoccurring authorization, whatever frequency you need to. But if you've got that and the customer is doing that, then the insights you can get from open bank, and are, you know, potentially very powerful in terms of, potential vulnerabilities that could be identified as well but what about, what about vulnerability we talked a lot about affordability what about vulnerability i mean so we talk about affordability linking back to open banking extra data richness of data what, what what else what else can be available in terms of assessing risks of vulnerability and then potentially different different kind of treatments i think there's, there's, there's probably some simple practices that can be deployed for vulnerability at, at the minute very much the process within organizations is is the staff need to try and find that information out from the customer if they haven't self-disclosed it. And, you know, there's, there's, that's probably one of the most pressurized parts of the, jo uh, the job role for a member of staff now, certainly in collections, is, you know, putting that training into practice because I think, you know, for the past five years, there has been a lot of investment made in training to make sure staff are equipped enough and are confident enough to try and identify vulnerabilities. But I think one of the sort of really simple and tested things around having a safe medium for customers to, to disclose vulnerability, because it's not an easy thing for a customer to, you know, say I'm vulnerable and explain their situation to a stranger. We even see that in the, in the debt advice world, even with an independent debt advice um, advisor, customers are still looking to do that. But what's quite untested is if, you know, it doesn't have to be through an income and expenditure journey, but it's in a, a, having a digital medium for a customer to disclose their vulnerabilities and give consent to share that. We, we trialled that with Pay Planner um, about six or seven months ago, and we saw an increase around about 23% more customer self-disclosing the vulnerabilities than what we did when we didn't have that option available. Mm. Uh, just, just a question. Do you? Um, sorry, I know I'm, I'm supposed to answer the questions, not ask the questions. So sorry, Chris. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Have you seen anything at the front end where lenders actively ask customers if they're vulnerable at the point of lend? I.e., you know, I'm a wheelchair user. I've got cancer. Because again, you know, just because you've got a vulnerability should not preclude you from having credit. Um, and therefore, I think what we need to probably do is, you know, as a society, and it's, you know, it's a disability piece as well in the wider part is, you know, we, we use vulnerability as a dirty thing. And so if a customer is vulnerable, crikey, put cotton wool around them, you know, whereas actually what, we, it's almost like a disability. We need to understand right at the start as society, okay, you've got something special about this customer that needs special support because they're potentially vulnerable. What is that? 
should they still get credit and can they still afford to pay? And I accept on the journey things happen that are out of control and there's particularly vulnerable customers that need a different treatment. But I don't know, do you see anything at the point of lend that anybody's doing to, to try and screen and support and lend to customers that are vulnerable? Short answer for me is no. Well, well, well I mean, here's that. So here's a, here's a longer answer, Craig. Um, there's 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 two answers to 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 your point. Yeah. So look, I I literally had this conversation with a regulator last week or two weeks ago, where I said, look, uh, someone to be vulnerable. So a classic vulnerability circumstance uh, would be a bereavement. Yeah. So let's let's take it away from some of the physical stuff. Let's talk about a bereavement. Um, and and you know they say we say yeah wrap that customer in cotton we'll look after them yeah but you know what that that, that that customer might have a valid need for credit yeah to pay for funeral expenses so actually we need to have that grown up piece around it so I completely agree with you um, in what you say I think the regulatory environment is such that it makes it really hard to have that grown up conversation yeah because I could instantly see. The, the the recoil on the FCA's supervisory team's face when you talk about look a bereaved person might need credit <gasps> you can't do that well why not you know so so to me so much of our regulatory tool um, has been set by emotion you know and what the regulator feels should be happening as opposed to kind of rationality about what's going on, you know, and what consumers actually mean. And there's no, I, I, I've been trying to sort of square those two points for the last five years and I've, I've not got an answer yet. I mean, vulnerability is very much used almost like this binary thing. I mean, I've just done it, haven't I? So you you either are or you're not, and then it, and then and then they come out saying, well, like it's sort of like, but well, it's now fifty percent of people could be vulnerable if you look at it through through what through one lens. But it's but it's not really a binary thing. It's much more sort of like shades of grey, isn't it? Um, I mean, do you think do you think the regulators do you think the regulators starting to come to that point of view? I kind of felt with some of the consumer duty, it kind of felt like it was going that way. I mean, is there is it evolving in that direction? It sounds like it's maybe not far enough, is your view? No, it's not. But I think I think I'm going to be really candid now, and I, I, I don't know I don't know who's on who's listening, right? But I I just wonder if you're the regulator, are you putting your top talent in consumer credit, right? You know, so you're probably not. You know, forgive me. You know, some some are really really good, and I guess what what that means is so much of the regulatory guidance is based around where we can get really big harm, and the really big harm comes in. You know what? Think about how much regulation there is about assets, investments, right? And think about how few consumers actually use those services. Yeah, and and a lot of the stuff around vulnerability, consumer duty, and stuff makes a lot of sense when you look at it in the context of high value stuff for a very small tranche of consumers. We're, so where I think we've got a massive problem is that we try to apply those kind of standards um, to to consumer credit where consumer credit is the day-to-day -day stuff. Yeah, people use credit every day. And, and in every day, you get a huge range of potential circumstances. And that's where these rules, I think, tend to, to not work. And it's not even the rules, actually. Because the rules, and this is why you have principle-based rules, to give us that flexibility. To me, it comes down to the application and interpretation of those rules by regulators. Mm. And I, I'm kind of interested, just sparking off a thought there in terms. Of, I suppose we talked a bit about modelling. We talk about modelling versus human interaction and rules and emotion and those kind of things. And 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 I think just like the maths might say, you can identify someone as vulnerable, potentially at risk, or some of the, those kind of nuances. But did you think there's a, a, a almost like a, a reluctance to just use the maths, and we're almost like reliant on people being involved as that sort of becomes a bit of a safety net for us? Or because the maths might say yes. I mean, I think Craig, you said it earlier that the mass you rely on the mass because the mass is probably more accurate. But you know, having a human involved gives you a little bit of that comfort blanket. Do you think that's is is there a little bit of that going on? Is that is that more evolution we need to do in terms of risk assessment? Maybe trusting the mass and the data a little bit more rather than less. It depends where in your cycle you are, I guess. You know, mm. and the problem is there is no right answer to get every individual yeah. case. You know, we did quite a lot of call listening just to check the quality of calls. And you listen to some customers, um, and then this is a piece of the amount of clients I'm speaking to where they've got huge vulnerable books um, where the customer says they're vulnerable, they make a record on the system, tick the vulnerable flag, go through yeah. Texas, and the account sits there forever. That's mm -hmm. not a good outcome. 
You know, yeah. <laughs> it's not a good outcome for the customer because the customer sits concerned about that debt that's due, although they're not getting chased. And what you do need probably at this point is a human intervention to assess the needs of that customer and come up with an appropriate um, resolution. So I, I think with with vulnerability, you either need a, a really clever form to capture the vulnerability that the customer completes and or a human doing the same thing, but it's a human or a machine. It's almost irrelevant. You need to understand the issues surrounding that particular customer and how you can resolve it, you know, to achieve good outcome for both you and the customer. Um, so, so I think it is horse. If you can use tech, fine. If you can use a person, fine. This isn't about using scoring data. It's about understanding what the issue is and what the available options are. So that, that's just a process once you've identified as an issue. Um, I think we've probably been talking more about how we underwrite cases. Should we lend to vulnerable customers? You know, and, and what are the data sources other than CRA data? And I think what, what I'm so coming back to the first question, what other data sources should we be using other than CRA and open banking? I think the answer here was it would be really handy to have some kind of government database, a central database that identifies the stuff that isn't in the data the potential mm -hmm. vulnerabilities, the potential disabilities, HMRC, payroll data. You know, we're never going to get it for GDPR purposes, but that would be pretty interesting, pretty helpful. Then from a regulatory perspective, can we, can we lend to those customers? How do, we, how do we change perceptions? And then, you know, from a collections perspective, when you identify a vulnerability, either through one of these data sources or because the customer tells you how do you handle it, you know, I think if you've got good, good automatic processes, great, or a human, great. But let's offer both options and let the customer decide which channel they want to go through because the 70-year-old wants to speak to a person, probably, uh, whereas the 22-year-old wants to do it on, the, on an app. Hmm. And, as, and using the extra data, and there's different sort of modeling techniques. And there's been a lot sort of made around things like AI, ML, those sort of things has been sort of talked a bit about. I mean, and it, and it can give you extra extra degrees of freedom or you know, extra... extra, extra um, uh, uh, microscope in terms of like looking at different segments, maybe the finer kind of kind of kind of tooth, um, uh, finer kind of magnification. I mean, is that an area that you think can be looked at? We made the most of that, uh, and maybe Shiraz, so I've asked ask, ask your kind of view on, on on that a little bit in terms of like you know, are we making enough of the data, um, and are some of the new techniques possible? Is that just a, again just a it, it takes away from we actually need to have good processes as much as just doing the analytics. No, you, you need to do the analytics. Um, the problem, in my experience, in my view, is it's, it's really hard to turn that on a dime. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, it, to be doing really good analytics, you kind of need to be setting up your data structure, your data warehouse, in such a way that allows you to do nimble machine learning, right? Mm. But, but doing it in that elegant way takes time. And, and actually, the benefit of doing it in that way is not, it's not going to give you immediate return. So there's always a commercial kind of push to try and get it to be just good enough. And, you know, you know we, we all run businesses. We all understand that actually good enough is, is generally the mantra. So I think for me, that's one of the biggest challenges, actually, is, is you know, there's, there's lots of data. We can look at it better. But, and the key point, and, and you know, I think Andrew mentioned this earlier. Yeah, I mean, you know, who right now, when they're doing a collections call, can even join the application data to the collections call and go, hey, Mr. Customer, this is what you told me three months ago, what's happened, right? Because actually, if it was my money and I was a bank manager and, 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 I, and so I left them with some money and six months later, they come back, go, well, I can't afford to pay you now. I'd go, well, hang on, six months ago, you told me this, what, what's going on? You know, so, so actually to sort of structure, so we can't even structure our own data routinely in such a way to allow us to have that kind of consistency of view from origination to application. And then to then kind of get our data structured in such a way that we can join all that other stuff up in a way that's insightful and can be learned from, I, you know. So to me, that's the, the, you know, we're getting into real nuts and bolts around data warehousing, uh, which is probably quite boring, but actually probably might be the real, the real answer to the question. Yeah, I, I like what you're saying about sort of like, we, we're taking the human out, but now we just was like, if it was your money, you'd have, that's a human interaction. You're almost like saying, well, like, you know, I lent you the money three months ago. What, what's happened with it? And it becomes a human kind of conversation there, which is actually quite easier for us as humans to understand, isn't it? We've sort of, you know, broke, broken that out to a certain extent. I mean, I mean, uh, Andrew, I was going to come back to you just in terms of, I suppose, you know, how do we make sure we got the best customer outcomes? We talked a little bit about scoring, data, segmentation, those kind of things. But, I mean, the, the process piece was also was also linked to, like, because it does have humans at the end of the day. At the end of the day they borrowed the money. They're, they're the people who need to like repay it back. I mean, 
how do you make sure that the process is generating like the good good customer outcomes as well? I think you know what I've, what we're saying now in collections more so is is NPS. So NPS net promoter score and understanding what the customer experience is being like linking that to, to the outcomes that the customer's in is being more heavily used in collections where NPS you know, has historically been used in, you know, outside of financial services or in other areas of financial services. So, you know, we've got, we've got clients now who want to know, you know, what the experience has been like of somebody capturing affordability. That's the level of detail they want to get to and that NPS is good, but now they're wanting, you know, anecdotal customer feedback. So they want to add things to the, to the, to the affordability journey where the customer can give feedback, good or bad. And what we tend to find is the, the feedback we get is much more insightful for those customers that, you know, started the process and dropped out of it to try and mm. understand, you know, from a, from a selfish point of view, maybe as a, as a tech provider, is it something to do with the tech or is it something to do with the relationship that they have with that particular creditor that they're dealing with? And sometimes you get feedback, which, which benefits us and benefits the clients around what, what that is. So, from, from that perspective, that's really important now. But I mean, you know, in terms of in terms of outcomes, for, from from our point of view, it's it's very simple when it's when it's collections and this technology that we use. Has a customer started an IE process? Have they completed it? And has the lender been able to make a, an affordable arrangement with that customer? And is that customer keeping to that arrangement from from a, from a very high level point of view for what good looks like from an outcome point of view? That's that's what we measure ourselves on, and what's what our clients are measuring themselves on when using our technology. Mm. Now you've got this, 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 you know, that's that's a great result there. But you've got other other segments of customers where, you know, they don't go through that process, or they haven't finished 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 that process. They've, they've started it only. Um, it's around understanding. Well, have they then? Subsequently, gone back through that process at a later date and completed it. Where are they now? What are they doing? Yeah, yeah. So, and, and I suppose, do you have an issue? I suppose in terms of like time lags to outcomes and those kind of things. And you know, what are the, what are some of the leading indicators you've got to think about? Uh, I think you know, from a from our point of view, that you know, you want to make sure that if somebody's completed a, a, a process, you've asked them to do something. You mm. need to make sure that that customer's not being left by the wayside for that particular next process to take up and, and you know commonly our, our customers will go through an income and expenditure the lender will get that back if we go in their collections operation it be looked at they'll then call that customer to around what the sla is of doing that how long's the customer wait before they get a cut we get the call back to finish that That's process easy. and create that arrangement and that was something the fca picked up and they did the, the, the coronavirus link forbearance review um, back in 2020 is around Digitalization is great, but if there's this if there's human intervention that needs to conclude that process, you can't allow customers to be waiting, you know, long periods of time before that process is concluded where there's human intervention taking up the process after. Right. Okay. Um, we're, we're almost at time. There are a couple of questions that came in. I just want to go back. So one was around uh, buy now, pay later. Where does this fit, fit into risk assessment? You know, and it seems like that's starting to flow through or starting to see that. I mean, how do we sort of see that in terms of like assessing collection risk? Maybe people who just got buy now, pay later. Is that a risk or is it not a risk? Um, I mean, do we need to start thinking about that? Um, you know, in terms of like maybe even seeing the volume flow through. Any views on the buy now, pay later market in, in collections? Or I'll tell you in a year when we see the data. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of volume. There's a lot of volume flowing. Um, some of the numbers that I've heard are, are anecdotally crazy. Some of the numbers that I've seen because some of the business I'm involved in are, are pretty big. So, um, from yeah, I think <laughs> if you've got a lot of volume, then you've got a big potential risk, haven't you? So yeah, to Craig's point, let's see how that risk crystallizes over a year. I've, but is that is that potentially um, you know I say contingent contingent risk that's sitting there that we're not necessarily aware of because we don't have visibility over the data enough of the data yet? I mean, is 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 the is the, that could that be a potential another indicator which might come through and we'll, we'll start to be able to use that in terms of our our risk assessments or understanding that that segmentation of you know, individuals almost? Is it is isn't the buy now pay later customer quite a big market again? So so again, I've never used it bizarrely, but I know people that do. Um, you know, why not take free credit if it's available? So you've got yeah. Prime, you know, near Prime, Subprime, 
I think there's a lot of high cost customers that are using it. Um, you know, you've got the the, the, the ex-probi customers. There's a whole array of customers in there. So I don't think it's a simple binary answer. For me, as a, as a debt purchaser and a collector, the challenge is the low balances, the 60, 70 quid, you know, yeah. average balance, a uh, huge volume of transactions, but relatively low ticket. Um, so how will that play out? Very hard to say when we're completely blind to the data. Sorry, yeah. Charles, were you going to say something? No, no, the low ticket volume is a great point. Um, look, and you're right, yeah, I've always said this. It's the same customers that used to be, you know, buy now, so high cost short term credit isn't there. Most of that high cost short term credit was to either pay for priority bills or was to, you know, um, facilitate discretionary consumption, which now buy now, pay later is doing. Those consumers, Maybe the average ticket size being so low is keeping the direct behavioral connection between the borrowing and the consumption. So you're not you've not got that kind of inherent rolling up going on. So that structurally might just help keep a lid on some of the sort of the defaults that you might expect to see if it was a different product serving that portfolio. Um, but also, if it is, you know, the, the number of consumers hasn't changed. Huge volume, low ticket size, but I bet average debt per consumer across all of them is probably enough, you know, mm. probably quite high. So I think what we'll see over the next year or two is as we start to see them joining uh, data with the bureaus, as more of the buy now, pay later stuff gets into the debt purchases, we'll then start to aggregate the data up. I think we'll begin to understand what the potential size of the problem is. Um, but my, my pet theory is you'll have actually low ticket size per per debt, but probably a decent ticket size per customer. And I guess the trick would be how quickly we can join those two data points together. I think I, I read somewhere as well, Chris, that I think of all buy now, pay later customers, I think around about 10% of them when they take out buy now, pay later, 10% them are, have got debts you know, with, with DCAs and debt purchases already. Mm. Uh, I mentioned there around the, the CRAs, so... One of the things that, from a collections point of view, that um, lenders are looking at to try and, you know, you know, provide training to their staff because this is going to become more. This is going to become visible very soon when customers start falling into arrears on traditional debts, mortgages, credit cards. They're going to have that view of their credit as a buy now, pay later is going to be included in there. Around, well, how do we cater for this? Do we pro rata this include as an unsecured non non priority debt? What does that look like? How do we approach that shopper? Because I think people are going to very much look view a buy now, pay it later debt like the credit cards and probably prioritise it over other debts that they should, they should be prioritising. Yeah. It's interesting. There's certainly lots for us to think about. So uh, I see that Colin's appeared, which probably means that we're, we're at that time. So um, so, so Andrew, Craig and uh, Shiraz, I wanted to thank you very much for, for joining us on, on this panel. Uh, great insights as, 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 as ever. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, uh, Craig. I appreciate that as well. So it's, it's, that's good. So it's good to have a bit of interaction. It's, it's fantastic. So um, thanks very much. Um, uh, and I'll hand it back over to, uh, to Colin. Thanks, Chris. Yep, really great uh, discussion, guys. Thank you very much for that. Um, interesting. Um, buy now, pay later is another to do uh, on, our, on our list of things to do. Uh, another thing to look at coming up. So as if we haven't got enough on our plate already. But yeah, no, interesting stuff. Thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to have a, a short break before we go on to our next session. So what's the time now? Uh, 11, so the next session starts at 11.55. So around about 20 minutes time, we'll have that next session, which is going to look at propensity to pay. Um, obviously, I want to thank everybody who joined us in this session and took part in the polls as well and the, the, the job question that we got in as well. Um, if you want to log in for the next session now, you can do so by clicking on one of the links on this platform. Um, but obviously, I'd like to thank uh, the panellists for their time here. So obviously, a big thank to Craig, Shiraz and um, Andrew for his insight and obviously Chris for chairing that. Chris will join me in the next session. But for now, I'd say thank you for everybody who's been who's viewed this session and we'll catch up soon. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks.